We're in Judges, session 12, where we'll be focusing on chapters 19 and 20. I want to warn you right now that this Bible study tonight is rated X. Small children, immature adults, we invite you to go uh, do something else tonight (laughs) because it's going to be a disturbing evening. In fact, these chapters are some of the chapters that are used by adversaries to try to get the Bible banned from libraries where children could be present. People have pointed to these chapters as examples of just how awful the Bible really is. Unless you've come across some of this, you probably think I'm being facetious. I'm not. There are people that, uh, you know, <laughs> try to take that kind of view. But they are very disturbing chapters, so we'll just jump in. You know, it's interesting. In these chapters, these final chapters of the book of Judges, we're going to discover their narratives of wife abuse, blatant homosexuality, gang rape leading to murder, injustice, brother killing brother, kidnapping, and the list might even be extended. This is tough stuff. The writer, I think, had as his intention to include this narrative to indicate just the kind of low point that Israel descended to. And I think he made his point, as you'll see before we go. Samuel Johnson, back in 1783, says, I've lived to see things all as bad as they can be. (laughs) I wonder what he would say today. On the one hand, this will be a shocking chapter. On the other hand, as we stand back and look at the news the newspapers, the kidnappings, and we'll go through the list, but it's pretty grim today. You know, according to the American Psychological Association, there are five violent acts per hour on primetime TV. Uh, And on Saturday mornings, when your children are watching cartoons, the violent acts per hour multiplied by five times. Now, admittedly, they're just cartoons, and yet that's what they are, you know. Now, this chapter is going to open with that familiar refrain, In those days, Israel had no king. We've seen in in chapter 17, 18, and so forth, that idolatry had characterized the nation. The coming chapters that we're going to encounter will point to anarchy, injustice, and so forth, partly due to the fact they had no central authority. You might realize, I think, that many scholars assume that Samuel was the writer of the book of Judges. In any case, the book of Judges certainly sets the stage for uh, Samuel and the advent of the kings, Saul, David, and so on. But another aspect of what we're going to get into here is if evil isn't dealt with properly, it will grow. It tends to be contagious. We certainly see that in our society. We're going to find out that the sin of the city of Gibeah infected the uh, tribe of Benjamin and led to a war that almost wiped out the entire tribe. So let's just jump in here. We're in Judges chapter 19, verse 1. It came to pass in those days when there was no king in Israel that there was a certain Levite sojourning on the side of Mount Ephraim who took to him a concubine out of Bethlehem, Judah. Now this has incidentally no connection with the Levite that we explored in chapter 17 and 18. No connection, I don't believe. But if you thought that that Levite, back in chapter 17, and he was a reprobate, uh, you'll probably conclude that um, this unnamed Levite is uh, certainly a scoundrel of the basest sort. Today we'd probably call him a party animal. We'll see that in chapter 19, verses 4, 6, 8, and 22. He uh, walked in darkness and jeopardized his own life and the lives of those with him. We're going to find out that he treated his concubine in a shocking manner while she was alive and even after she was dead. And what he did then precipitated a civil war in the nation. So that's what's coming. Now we see the term concubine here. This is an interesting word. Webster's defines that as a a woman who cohabits a man without being married. And that's kind of naive because there is a biblical definition that it's a woman who's married but doesn't cohabit, except it is 
a second-class kind of marriage. It's not a real marriage as you and I would think of it. See, a concubine in some of the cultures was a lawful wife who was guaranteed only food, clothing, and marital privileges. And that's in, you find that supported in Exodus 21 and Deuteronomy 21. Any children she bore were considered legitimate, although they didn't necessarily inherit. So it's a complex. Not as simple as just, well, he had a mistress. No, it's not that simple. If a man's wife was barren, he sometimes took a concubine in order to establish a family. We saw that happen, of course, with Jacob and the 12 tribes. Two wives and two concubines, in effect. Called a wife in many contexts. Now, the law controlled concubinage, but the Lord did neither approve nor encourage it. You'll find a number of Old Testament men. Let's see, I think I've got some. The uh, Old Testament that had concubines. That Abraham had concubines. Jacob, Gideon, Saul, David, and Solomon. Solomon had a lot of wives. What, 300 wives and 700 concubines? He took a concubine out of Bethlehem, Judah. His concubine played the whore against him and went away from him unto her father's house to Bethlehem, Judah, and was there four whole months. So this is an unfaithful concubine. Her husband arose, verse 3, and went after her to speak friendly to her and to bring her again, having his servant with him and a couple of asses. And she brought him into her father's house. And when the father of the damsel saw him, he rejoiced to meet him. So he and his father-in-law get along great. I want you to notice the hints here too. This guy is not poor. He's got uh, resources. He's got a servant. He's got a couple of asses, which is not trivial in those days. And he comes to his father-in-law's house and to make reconciliation with his uh, unfaithful concubine. He and his father-in-law discovered they enjoyed each other. And they spent five days eating, drinking, and making merry for four days and part of a fifth before the Levite finally decided he had to keep moving on. So um, he bowed within three days and they did eat and drink and lodge there. It came to pass on the fourth day when they arose early in the morning that he rose up to depart. The damsel's father said unto his son-in-law, his son-in-law, Comfort thine heart with a morsel of bread, and afterward go your way. So they sat down, eat and drink, both of them together. For the damsel's father had said unto him, Be content, I pray thee, to tarry all night, and let thy heart be merry. He likes it, this guy. He likes to have his son-in-law around. These guys are having a great time. When the man rose up to depart, his father-in-law urged him. Therefore he lodged there again. He's, he's, uh, it's getting hard to get away he rose early in the morning on the fifth day to depart. The damsel's father said, Comfort thine heart, I pray thee. And they tarried until the afternoon, and they did eat both of them together. You get the feeling this guy knows how to have a good time. When the man rose up to depart, he and his concubine, his servant, gets that, his father-in-law, the damsel's father said to them, Behold, now the day draweth toward evening. I pray you tarry all night. Behold, the day groweth to an end. Lodge here that thy heart may be merry, and tomorrow get you early on your way that thou mayest go home. But the man would not tarry that night, but he rose up and departed and came over against Jebus, which is Jerusalem. Now this is unusual that you see the name there. This is the early name for Jerusalem. It's named for the Amorite group of uh, Jebusites who lived there. It wouldn't be be until David that he would uh, conquer that town, and it would become Jerusalem. But at this point, it's a pagan town. When they were by Jebus, the day was far spent. The servant said unto his master, Come, I pray thee, let us turn in into the city of the Jebusites and lodge in it. Seems reasonable enough. His master said unto him, We will not turn aside hither into the city of a stranger that is not of the children of Israel. We will pass over to Gibeah. Uh, they're trying to avoid this town because apparently, you know, it's a, it's a pagan town. But you're going to discover, uh, see, he wanted to be with his own people. He's going to go, in effect, north about six miles extra so that he can be with his own people, not be with these pagan Jebusites. Now, he, the men of Gibeah, where he's headed, are going to turn out to be as wicked as any heathen around them. But we'll find that out the hard way. So he says, uh, this is not for the children of Israel, we'll pass over to Gibeah. And he said to his servants, come, let us draw near to one of these places to lodge all night in Gibeah or in Ramah. They passed on, went their way, and the sun went down upon them when they were by Gibeah, which belongeth to Benjamin. Benjamin is the region. 
That's going to be important later. Benjamin is uh, right close to Judah. It's, it's, in fact, some people would technically, the, the city of Jerusalem is almost in Benjamin. It gets absorbed in the tri- Judah anyways, you'll see for a lot of reasons. But anyway, that's where they are. And they turned aside thither to go in and to lodge in Gibeah. And when he went in, he sat him down in a street of the city, for there was no man that took them into his house to lodging. He couldn't find a place to stay. No one would take him in. He's going to spend the night on the street. That's apparently the situation. This is a tragic lapse in hospitality, which incidentally in the Middle East is one of the greatest crimes. There is a crime. You you can be under the tent of your enemy, and while you're under his tent, you're safe. I remember when I was in Algeria, I was startled to discover that uh, it's a safe place. If you're their guest, we were the guest of the government, no one would touch us. There's a culture in a number of the uh, uh, Middle Eastern tribal communities that hospitality is inviolate. And they make a thing of that. To someone who's sensitive to that, this already is a shock that no man would take them into his house to lodging. How interesting it is. I can't help. The thought goes through my mind. I can remember a couple where she was pregnant and couldn't find refuge in Bethlehem of Judah. That became famous for the rest of eternity. Anyway, uh, verse 16, And behold, there came an old man from his work out of the field at even, which was also of Mount Ephraim, and he sojourned in Gibeah. But the men of the place were Benjamites. So the pl- Gibeah is a place of Benjamites, but it happens that there's this old man who's coming in from the field who happens to be from Ephraim. He is going to, when he, when he lifted up his eyes, he saw a wayfaring man in the street of the city. And the old man said, Whither goest thou? And whence comest thou? So where are you going? Where are you from? What's going on? Hey, fella, what's happening? He said unto him, We are passing from Bethlehem Judah toward the side of the Mount of Ephraim. From thence am I. And I went to Bethlehem Judah, but I am now going to the house of the Lord, and there is no man that receiveth me to house. Yet there is both straw and provender for our asses, and there is bread and wine also for me and for thy handmaid, and for the young man which is with thy servants there is no want of anything. And the old man said, Peace be with thee. Howsoever let all thy wants lie upon me, only lodge not in the street. So this guy's going to put him up. He doesn't want those guys in the street. See, this will probably remind you, for in many ways, it will remind you of Genesis 18 and 19. Sodom and Gomorrah. Remember when the two angels visited Lot? What a mess that was. Well, we're going to see a replay of that in a sense here. The old man said, Peace be with thee, howsoever, let all thy wants lie upon me. Only lodge not in the street. So he brought him into his house and gave provender unto the asses and washed their feet and did eat and drink. So everything's going swimmingly here, huh? Except here it starts to get pretty grim. Now as they were making their hearts merry, (laughs) this guy knows how to live, doesn't he? Behold, the men of the city... Certain sons of Belial beset the house round about and beat at the door and spake to the master of the house, the old man, saying, Bring forth the man that came into thine house that we may know him. And that means exactly what you think it does to experience him. These are the homosexuals of the city. Just as they were threatening the two angels that were in Genesis 19. And by the way, just as a footnote on this, when you study Genesis 19, you may recall Genesis 18, the Lord and two angels visit Abraham. The two angels have an errand to run in Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham and the Lord get into an interesting discussion. The Lord says, I'm, he shares with him what's going to happen. And that's a passage in Genesis 18 you really have to somehow read. If you have, if you have the gift of dialects, if you can, I don't happen to have, but some people are very clever, they can do, if you can read that with a real Jewish accent, you need to read Abraham's negotiations with God. What if there's 50 righteous there? Well, if there's 50 righteous, I'll spare the city. Well, what about it's 45? 40. He, he goes through this whole routine. There's a very interesting principle announced there. As long as there's any righteous, the city will be spared. He gets down to 10, and even there, Abraham realizes he's pushing his luck, so he backs off. 
But then in Genesis 19, these two angels come to the house of Lot, and the same thing kind of thing happens. The homosexuals want to take these guys. And Lot even offers his daughters to this mob rather than let them violate his guests. Strange. Hard for us to understand, even that. Of course, they're angels. They, they use supernatural means to blind the people around and put them to confusion. This guy's not a, this Levite and his concubine not, don't have super, those kind of gifts. So these, this mob is trying to, um, experience his guest. And we will learn in a little bit later tonight that they were threatening his life. This isn't just a, a rowdy bunch. It's really serious. Uh, his, uh, he felt that his life was at risk. And so that's a dimension we might miss is if we just read this sort of casually. These men were indulging in obviously practices that are contrary to nature. I encourage you to read Romans 1, verses 24 through 27, if you have any doubts about that. The laws of God in Leviticus 18.22, Leviticus 20.13. You might take a good look at 1 Corinthians 6 while you're at it. So the word no in Judges 19, verse 22, means to have sexual experience with. And they were excited because there is a new man in town. They wanted to enjoy him, so... So the man, the master of the house, went out unto them and said unto them, Nay, my brethren, nay, I pray you, do not so wickedly, seeing that this man has come into mine house, do not this folly. So the owner of the house is trying to quiet this down. But he's not going to succeed, obviously. What's hard for you and I to grasp is the bizarre offer he makes this unruly mob. He says, Behold, here is my daughter, a maiden, and his concubine. Them I will bring out now. And humble ye them, and do with them what seemeth good unto you. But unto this man do not so vile a thing. This is weird stuff. Depraved, yes. But what's also strange is that he would regard the violation of his male guest as a more serious crime than the violation of his daughter and this concubine. We can't relate to that. We can't grasp that. But anyway, the men would not hearken to him. So the man took his concubine and brought her forth unto them. In other words, he didn't. they didn't take the daughter, but he took his concubine and offered it to this crowd, brought her forth unto them, and they knew her and abused her all that night. Until the morning. And when the day began to spring, they let her go. Then came the woman in the dawning of the day and fell down at the door of the man's house where her Lord was till it was light. And she doesn't survive the dawn. Her Lord rose up in the morning. This guy went to bed. He went to bed. The Lord rose up in the morning and opened the doors of the house and went out to go his way. He was going to go on. He didn't go out to look for her. Had a good night's sleep. Came out and he was going to go on his way. You've got to be kidding. And behold, the woman, his concubine, was fallen down at the door of the house and her hands were upon the threshold. In other words, he, he goes out to go, to leave, and he stumbles over her. There she is. It wasn't, it wasn't some search. He didn't rouse some neighbors to go after these guys or anything. Went, went to bed, had a good night's sleep. He said to her, Up, let us be going. But none answered. And the man took her up upon the ass, and the, the man uh, rose up upon the ass, and the man rose up and got him unto his place. And when he was come into his house, he took a knife. And he laid hold on his concubine, divided her together with her bones, it says in the King James, into twelve pieces. What that actually means is uh, literally what the Hebrew says, accord, he, he divided up according to her bones. And then we cut her apart limb by limb. Sort of like a priest preparing a sacrifice. He cut her into twelve parts and sent her into all the coasts of Israel. Most scholars read that as what she did. He cut her up into twelve parts and sent a part to each of the twelve tribes. And it was so that all that saw it said, 
There was no such deed done nor seen from the day that the children of Israel came up out of the land of Egypt unto this day. Consider of it, take advice, and speak your minds. It had the desired effect. It shocked the whole nation. In a sense, that's the only encouraging thing we've read so far. At least they were outraged. It's under, difficult for us to understand this passage, but it was also difficult for his contemporaries to understand it. And of course, he, he, what he meant to do, of course, is arouse the nation for some kind of hearing. He also may have been in his way trying to charge them with accountability for the death of his concubine. He certainly wanted to mobilize the support of the tribes to punish the men of Gibeah who had killed him. But, you know, strangely, he's the one that ought to be accountable for her death. He may be outraged here, and we're going to see what happens, but he's the guy that made it possible. He's the guy that gave her to that crowd of perverts. There was no such deed done nor seen from the day that the children of Israel came out out of the land of Egypt unto this day. Consider it, take advice, and speak your minds, and indeed they too. And the next chapter, chapter 20, deals with the assembly and what happens here. Then all the children of Israel went out, and the congregation was gathered together as one man, from Dan even to Beersheba, unto the land of Gilead, unto the Lord in Mizpah. From Dan to Beersheba. This is a phrase that's sort of like we would say in the, in the United States from Maine to California. Dan was in the uttermost parts of the north. Beersheba is down, Beersheba is down in, in the Negev, in the desert. The phrase is intended to embrace the land. What's interesting about that phrase, by the way, it's a phrase that generally doesn't get used before the days of Samuel. It's one of the hints that it was probably Samuel that actually wrote this. This is it's a, it's a, it's a phrase that he uses. And the chief of all the people, even of all the tribes of Israel, presented themselves in the assembly of the people of God, 400,000 footmen that drew the sword. Now, when he says uh, of all the uh, tribes, I'm assuming it's 11 tribes. The Benjamites were invited, but I don't think they showed up. You'll see why. 400,000 of armed trained warriors. Get that in your mind as we go. Gilead, by the way, is a term used, we should be familiar with by this time in the book of Judges. It's, it generally is an idiom referring to the Transjordan, the people on the other side, east side of the Jordan. The East Bank, if I can use that expression. And Mitzvah is about four miles north of Gibeah, eight miles north of Jerusalem. It's interesting that this took place before, in the time of the Judges, before there was a king, but they were able to muster a crowd. They did have, they didn't have a central government as such, but the tribes were still united and were able to muster troops and were able to wage war together. That itself is an interesting observation. The children of Benjamin had heard the children of Israel were going up to Mizpah, then said the children of Israel, tell us how was this wickedness? So he gets a chance to tell his story. So the Levite, the husband of the woman that was slain, answered and said, I came into Gibeah that belongeth to Benjamin, I and my concubine, to lodge. And the men of Gibeah rose up against me and beset the house round about, uh, upon me by night, and thought to have slain me. See, this rabble-rousing crowd was probably more serious than we'd probably give it credit for being, so to speak. And my concubine have they forced that she is dead. So his position is, and it's probably not unreasonable in a sense, is that they threatened his life. He, had to, this was, he in fact, had to do this under, under a threat of uh, being killed. So that... that uh, that certainly is an excuse, but it certainly it may also have been uh, justified. In any case, I mean, his view could be justified. And I took my concubine and cut her in pieces and sent her throughout all the country of the inheritance of Israel, for they have committed lewdness and folly in Israel. No kidding. Behold, ye are all children of Israel. Give here your advice and counsel. So the Levi- Levites got his day in court, so to speak. He tells his story, his sending of this grotesque package to each of the twelve tribes has had its effect. They've gathered together and are hearing them out. And of course, they are indeed outraged. All the people arose as one man, saying, We will not any of us go to his tent, neither will we any of us turn into his house. But now shall this, the thing which we will do to Gibeah, we will go up by lot against it. It's a unanimous situation. And we will take ten men of a hundred throughout all the tribes of Israel, and a hundred of a thousand, and a thousand out of ten thousand, to fetch 
victuals for the people, that they may do when they come to Gibeah of Benjamin, according to all the folly that they have wrought in Israel. And so all the men of Israel were gathered together against the city, knit together as one man. So they have one-tenth of the troops gather supplies for the rest of them who are going to do the fighting. That's, that's really what seems to be uh, going there. And so they, they issue a verdict, and they do a vow. The verdict was that the men of Gibeah were guilty and should be handed over to the authorities to be slain. And that's according to Deuteronomy 13, incidentally, verses 12 to 18. There's a vow that you haven't got to yet. The vow that we'll come into later is that they also represented that they would, none of the tribes would allow their daughters to be in marriage to the men of Benjamin. And the tribes of Israel sent men through all the tribe of Benjamin saying, What wickedness is this that is done among you? Now therefore deliver us the men, the children of Belial that were in Gibeah, that we may put them to death and put away evil from Israel. So they're out to hang these guys. You can understand how they feel. But the children of Benjamin would not hearken to the voice of their brethren. See, the tribes were concerned to put away evil out of the land. That's a phrase, by the way, that you'll find at least nine times in Deuteronomy. They wanted Benjamites to confess their sin and put this evil out of the land. According to Leviticus 20, verse 13, homosexuals were to be put to death. But that wasn't the crime that they're judging. See, since the Levite had willingly given his concubine to the men of Gibeah, you can hardly call their sin adultery. It's sin, but not adultery. The penalty for rape was death, and gang rape would be even more serious. Deuteronomy 22. Now, the tribe could also be quoting here a law concerning the wicked men of a city. In Deuteronomy 13, 12 to 18, uh, and they might be using that for their basis of action. So even though you may want to split hairs on some of these things, obviously they were guilty. Obviously they were due for some serious uh, uh, confrontation. But the Benjamites won't buy into this. They're going to take up arms against the 12 tribes. How many do we have? 400,000 among 11 tribes? The entire tribe of Benjamin is 27,000? You've got to be kidding. 20 to 1 odds? The children of Benjamin gather themselves together out of the cities unto Gibeah to go out to battle against the children of Israel. The children of Benjamin were numbered at that time out of the cities 20 and 6,000 men that drew the sword beside the inhabitants of Gibeah, which were numbered 700 chosen men. Among all these people, there were 700 chosen men left-handed. Everyone could sling stones at a hairbreadth and not miss. Now, this brings up, and let me remind you, something we went into when we were in chapter 3 of the book of Judges. You need to understand that the Benjamites were known for their uh, ambidextry. The, uh, the, there's one guy by the name of Ehud that uh, becomes the hero, of course, in chapter 3 of the book of Judges. The word there in the Hebrew is itter, which means bound, impeded. What it usually means is impeded on the right. That means they're left-handed. Uh, it's a man handicapped in the right hand is the way it's used there in chapter 3. And, of course, Ehud was distinctive in that he had a, uh, he was unable to use his right hand. He was impaired. So he was impeded in a, in a different sense. So he was left-handed by necessity. But he turns that, he turns that to his advantage because he goes to his workshop and builds a 20-inch double-edged sword and he puts the sword in his right side because he's got a left hand. In those days, it was conventional for warriors to have their, they were right-handed and their sword would be on the left side. And so that because of his infirmity, he was able to hide this sword and they didn't when they frisked him. So he went to Eglon, the king that he was going to assassinate, and he plunges this sword as the whole thing gets lost in the rolls of fat. And because he gets them by surprise, he gets out of there. And there's that whole story, I remind you. But again, this idea of left-handed, um, in that case, it was a handicap situation. In this case, it's an allusion to the tribe of Benjamin. And uh, these 700 could sling stones at a hairbreadth and not miss. They were professionals. They were warriors. They were sharp. 700 of the 26,000, or maybe in addition to 26,000, uh, but they're going up against 400,000. And the men of Israel, beside Benjamin, 
were numbered 400,000 men that drew the sword. All these were men of war. The children of Israel arose and went up to the house of God and asked counsel of God and said, Which of us shall go up first to the battle against the children of Benjamin? So they went to the house of God. They went to the tabernacle, which was probably at Shiloh. It might have been at Bethel. There's some uh, scholastic debate. It apparently would shift sometimes from one to the other. But in any case, they went to the tabernacle. They did it by presumably the ermine and thummim and whatever. They found out what God wanted them to do. And it says, The Lord said, Judah shall go up first. I want you to watch this because it raises some very strange issues. The Lord told him, let Judah go first. And the children of Israel rose up in the morning and encamped against Gibeah. And the men of Israel went out to battle against the Benjamin. And the men of Israel put themselves in array to fight against them at Gibeah. And the children of Benjamin came forth out of Gibeah and destroyed down to the ground of the Israelites that day 20 and 2,000 men. Whew! Of Judah. Wait a minute. I thought God said that they should go against and, and, and Judah should go first. Judah gets clobbered. 22,000. I infer, for reasons I'll show you in a little bit, that the Benjamites lost maybe 1,100. They wiped out 22,000 from the tribe of Judah. And the people, the men of Israel, encouraged themselves and set, I don't know how, and set their battle again in array in the place where they put themselves in array the first day. And the children of Israel went up and wept before the Lord until evening and asked the counsel of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up again to battle against the children of Benjamin, my brother? And the Lord said, Go up against him. So the children of Israel came near against the children of Benjamin the second day. Benjamin went forth against them out of the Gibeah the second day and destroyed down to the ground of the children of Israel. Again, 18,000 men, all these drew the sword. So they get clobbered a second time. Did a little better. They only lost 18,000 that day. And all the children of Israel and all the people went up and came to the house of God and wept and sat there before the Lord. Aha, and here's what they did. And they fasted that day until evening. Oh, yes, and they offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. As you try to wrestle with this text, the one thing we notice is this time they went at it properly. They went, they fasted and gave offerings before the Lord. The children of Israel inquired of the Lord, for the Ark of the Covenant of God was there in those days. And Phinehas, the son of Eliezer, the son of Aaron, stood before it in those days. And by the way, the reference to Phineas here implies that this was probably happening roughly at the time of the death of Joshua. So this is this the fact that it's at the end of the book doesn't mean it happened at the end of the book. The writer to the book of Judges apparently put these several episodes at the end to make his point of what the state of Israel was. It doesn't imply they're necessarily in chronological order. Phineas, the son of Eliezer, the son of Aaron, stood before it in those days, saying, Shall I yet again Go out to battle against the children of Benjamin, my brother, or shall I cease? And the Lord said, Go up, for tomorrow I will deliver them into thine hand. And Israel set liars in wait around Gibeah. What that means is we'll get to the details. It's going to give us a summary, and then it'll give us the details. They're going to set up an ambush. The fact that Israel consults with the Lord is part of the problem. But just because they go to the Lord, they also improve their tactics. The children of Israel went up against the children of Benjamin on the third day and put themselves in array against Gibeah, as at the other times. The children of Benjamin went out against the people and were drawn away from the city. And they began to smite of the people and kill, as at other times, in the highways, of which one goeth up to the house of God, and the other to Gibeah in the field, about thirty men of Israel. The Benjamites be able to, you know, they kill 30 of these guys. The children of Benjamin said, They are smitten down before us as at the first. But the children of Israel said, Let us flee and draw them from the city unto the highways. And all the men of Israel rose up out of their place and put themselves in array at Baal Tamar. And the liars in wait of Israel came forth out of their places, even out of the meadows of Gibeah. And there came against Gibeah 10,000 chosen men out of all Israel. And the battle was sore. But they knew not that evil was near them. 
The Lord smote Benjamin before Israel, and the children of Israel destroyed of the Benjamins that day twenty and five thousand and a hundred men. All these drew the sword. And so the children of Benjamin saw that they were smitten, for the men of Israel gave place to the Benjamites because they trusted unto the liars in wait, which they had set beside Gibeah. And the liars in wait waited, I should say hasted, and rushed upon Gibeah, and the liars in wait drew themselves along and smote all the city with the edge of the sword. Now there was an appointed sign between the men of Israel and the liars in wait, that they should make a great flame with smoke rise up out of the city. And when the men of Israel retired in the battle, Benjamin began to smite and kill of the men of Israel, about 30 persons. For they said, surely they are smitten down before us as in the first battle. But when the flame began to rise up out of the city with a pillar of smoke, the Benjamites looked behind them, and behold, the flame of the city ascended up to heaven. And when the men of Israel turned again, the men of Benjamin were amazed. For they saw that evil was come upon them, therefore they turned their backs before the men of Israel unto the way of the wilderness, but the battle overtook them. And them which came out of the cities destroyed in the midst of them. Thus they enclosed the Benjamites round about and chased them and trod them down with ease over against Gibeah toward the sun rising. And there fell of Benjamin eighteen thousand men. All these were men of valor. And they turned and fled toward the wilderness unto the rock of Rimmon. And they gleaned of them in the highways five thousand men and pursued hard after them unto Gideon, Gideon, excuse me, and uh, slew two thousand of them. So that all which fell that day of Benjamin were twenty and five thousand men that drew the sword. All these were men of valor. Let's summarize this. The uh, tribe of Benjamin had 26,700 in the total tribe, from verse 15. Um, Of course, the 11 tribes had 400,000. In the first few days, they lost 22,000. That first day, the 11 tribes did. The... uh, the second day, they lost 18,000 for a total of 40,000 killed. Benjamin, we figure, I infer from putting this together, about 1,100. But then the third day, they lose 18,000, then another 5,000, then another 2,000. So they actually lose about 25,100, according to verse 35, that day. Now, this is disastrous because they only have in the whole tribe 26,700. Uh, And the fact that there's only 600 men left in the tribe of Benjamin who escaped to the Rock of Rimmon is the subject of the next chapter. Because suddenly Israel shook up because they realize they have come very close to wiping out the entire tribe of Benjamin. Now you can be cynical and say, well, it's their own fault. They should have delivered up the guilty guys and been done with it. Okay, but they didn't. Civil war. And the Benjamites are rough, rough players. These are rough warriors. All in all, they did pretty well until that third day. And they got clobbered. 600 left. And we're going to talk about the strange aspects of this when we get to chapter 21. We won't try to squeeze that in tonight. It's very, very interesting that the promise of God to Israel that they'd have victory on the third day didn't lead to presumption. Think about that. Israel finally, after having several setbacks, God says, okay, I'm going to deliver them to you. They didn't kick back. They sharpened their wits. They developed this ambush strategy, which of course worked. See, the Israelites took up the same battle positions that they had before, and they deliberately fled as the Benjamites launched their attacks, so the Benjamites were drawn away from the city. Joshua used the same kind of strategy against Ai, you may recall, in Joshua chapter 8. And 10,000 of Israel's best uh, uh, attacked Gibeah frontally. That gave them a victory in the town. And then the Benjamin slides 25,100, almost their entire force. But 600 men, that's all that survived from the Benjamites, turned and fled to the wilderness under the Rock of Rimmon and abode in the rock for four months. They're in the wilderness. They're in hiding. They're, they're apparently secure because of the, the topography there, the terrain. The men of Israel turned again upon the children of Benjamin, smote them with the edge of the sword, as well as the men of every city, as the beast, and all that came into hand, as they set on fire all the cities they came to. So they're just, they're leveling the Benjamites. And uh, there is, in verse 48, uh, this indication that they uh, wiped out the towns and the beasts. 
There is a term in Hebrew called haram, which means totally destroyed. It's a term uh, that uh, usually implies, it's usually with a holy war, in which the city and the occupants are totally devoted, as they say, they would say, to destruction. The city of Jericho was in that category back there in Joshua. Everything in the city of Jericho was dedicated to the Lord. That is, they were to destroy it, not steal from it. That's where the sin of Achan and the Babylonian, that's why that was such a crime that he kept a little thing for himself. No, that was a big mistake, and that's what led to the defeat of Ai, as you know that story. The point is that everything in Jericho was under the ban, as the Hebrew would say. There's the whole idea that it's devoted means it's totally destroyed and so forth, and the whole Jericho thing is, is an example of that. There are many, many lessons we could draw from this, I think. One of the things, I think, that clearly should leap out at us from this chapter, as well as just any reading of the Torah, the five books of Moses, is that sin needs to be dealt with. Yes, in the theological sense, the blood of Christ is over, absolutely. But it also needs to be stopped. It needs to be put out of the camp. Because it's not only the guilt of the people sinning, sin itself is contagious. Look at your kids. Who are they running around with? It's the most serious disease of mankind. Derived from a genetic defect. Called sin. God takes sin seriously. We've just finished the study of the book of Leviticus. That should, I call it the most neglected book in the Bible. But it's important to really understand that God takes sin seriously. And we look at this, and of course, one of the purposes of this book of Judges, it's coming to a climax as we finish it up, is um, to recognize the depths to which Israel had fallen. And there are important historical and contextual issues there to set the stage for 1 Samuel and what comes. But it's also interesting, I think, that the book of Judges is in many respects surprisingly prophetic. Those places where the successors, the generation after Joshua, failed to follow through and root out the Canaanites, led to pockets of their enemies that are there today. Hebron, the Golan Heights, the Gaza. Make a map of those places that there were pockets that weren't, weren't dealt with, and they are the same places that are in the news on the front pages today. It's prophetic in that sense. I think the book of Judges is prophetic in another sense that, that is, uh, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. There was no king in Israel. The word of God, four, four conditions that characterize the whole book. There was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was, they thought was right in their own eyes. The word of God was disparaged or ignored. And they were in bondage. And that's our world today. There is no king in Israel. The good news is that the king is coming. There will be a false king coming first, but the, the, the real king will be coming to take charge for what he paid for. The seven-sealed book in the book of Revelation is the title deed. And the biggest escrow in the history of the universe will close when he comes to take that and take what he purchased. Everyone did what's right in their own eyes. That's true in our country. We have value relativism destroying the rule of law in this country. Everybody did what's right in their own eyes. Ask the executives of these corporations that stole. They did what was right in their eyes. The shock to me is not the executive steal. People do do steal, and they need to, and there's rules for that. They should go to jail. What shocks me is the referees were involved. If you ever spend any time with professionals from the big eight accounting firms, that's the expression from the old days, the big eight, obviously there's been mergers and stuff. Take them, they used to take themselves very seriously. Ethics, precision, and so forth, um, was the, the, was the, was the, the, uh, <laughs> the idol before which they worshipped. To have them in, involved in these frauds, apparently, is shocking. Everybody's doing what's right in their own eyes. It's scary. Stop. And of course, the word of God is is uh, being disparaged in our land. Praise God where it isn't, and we need to do everything we can to promote, encourage, and uh, illuminate the word of God every place we can, so we uh, so the Spirit can move. Let's.
stand for a closing word of prayer. Let's bow our hearts. Father, as we delve into your word and we see the days of the book of, of the time of the judges, we're appalled and yet, Father, we also feel we're looking in the mirror because our own land, with its heritage, which is so widely disparaged, is also at risk. Oh, Father, we do come before your throne acknowledging our sins, for they are many, but especially our sins of presumption and our sins of ingratitude. Oh, Father, please forgive us as we plead before your throne the blood of Jesus Christ in our behalf. And we would ask that, Father, so that we might also ask of you to reignite in each of us a hunger and an appetite for your word. Help us, Father, to be discerning and to understand how precious your law is and how desperately we need the Holy Spirit to give us victory over the sins that so easily beset us. Father, we ask for a revival in our land and let it begin with us, ourselves. We ask you that, Father, that the name of Jesus Christ may be glorified. We ask you, Father, to show yourself strong. Fill us with your Spirit, Father, that we might discern, understand, and respond to your heart, Father, and not our self-will. As we commit ourselves before you, Father, into your hands, without any reservation, in the name of Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.